the Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper primarily for the purpose that we who are his disciples might remember him. Do this, he says, in remembrance of me. And remembering him, particularly in his greatest act of obedience to the will of his Father, his death on the cross of Calvary. Therefore, tonight as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, let us focus on the greatness of Christ's sacrifice. The greatness of his sacrifice. And to that end, I want us to consider a portion of scripture that addresses that issue in a very concentrated way. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 18. For the law, verse 1, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, but the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they have not ceased to be offered? Because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he, Messiah, comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not taken, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings, and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then, he said, Messiah said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily, ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But he, Messiah, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. Then he says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Join our hearts to pray for the Lord's blessing as we consider this portion of this word. Let us pray.
Our God, we thank you for every opportunity for us to gather around your throne and gather around your word in order to hear your voice. For we confess that we are forgetful creatures. We are, we often forget the things that we already know and even the things we know do not impact us the way it should. We thank you then for every opportunity that you have given us to be exposed to your Holy Word and your promise to us of the help of the Holy Spirit to write your words upon the tablets of our hearts. Be with us, O Lord, as we consider your Word. Illumine our minds. Help us to understand your Word and give us believing hearts so that our hearing would truly profit our souls. Hear us and bless your word to our hearts, we pray. For these things we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. In this portion of scripture read in your hearing, the writer under the infallible guidance of the Holy Spirit puts a capstone to the greatness of Christ's sacrifice. And although many of the things he mentions here are things he has already mentioned earlier in the previous chapters of the book of Hebrews, here he gathers the threads together to emphasize the greatness of Christ's sacrifice. And you must not think that what the writer here is doing is superfluous or more than what is necessary for us. As one writer puts it, fascination with ritual and priestly activity has throughout the centuries diverted the attention of Christians from the ministry of Jesus in heaven and led them to feel deprived if they do not have something similar. It has even prompted them to devise it. Today the church finds herself surrounded and even invaded by religious syncretism and priest and priests. These things that the writer wrote is something that is not superfluous, it is something that is necessary. It is an important safeguard for us. Now in dealing with the greatness of Christ's sacrifice, the writer here in our text does mainly two things. First, he speaks about what the Old Testament sacrifices could not do and why. And secondly, he speaks of what the Lord Jesus did. So let's consider each of this one at a time. First, let us consider what the Old Testament sacrifices could not do and why. What was it that the Old Testament sacrifices could not do? Our text describe it in three different ways. Look at the first one in verse 1. For the law, referring to the old covenant that God established with the children of Israel in Mount Sinai, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make Perfect, here's our phrase, make perfect those who draw near. The Old Testament sacrifices is described as that which can never make perfect those who draw near. Now what does that mean? Could not make perfect 
those who draw near. Well, this refers to the drawing near to God's special presence in worship. Those old covenant sacrifices could never make perfect those who draw near to God's special presence, even in that special presence in the earthly tabernacle that God commanded Moses to build and which was later expanded under the direction of God during the time of Solomon in the building of the temple in Jerusalem. Those Old Testament sacrifices could never make perfect those who draw near to that special presence of God there in the earthly tabernacle. And to make perfect here simply means to make fit. Those Old Testament sacrifices could never make fit those who draw near to God's special presence even there in the earthly tabernacle. Therefore, the people were not allowed to enter the holy place. Only Levitical priests could enter. And they were not allowed to enter the Holy of Holies in that earthly tabernacle. Only the Levitical priests could enter the holy place and only the Levitical high priests could enter the Holy of Holies. And only once a year. So the Old Testament sacrifices could not make perfect or fit the people who draw near to God's special presence, to draw near to God's special presence even in the earthly tabernacle, the place of God's special presence under the old covenant. The Old Testament sacrifices could not make them fit to draw near to God's special presence. They could not enter the holy place. They could not enter the holy of holies. Another expression used in our text to describe what the Old Testament sacrifices could not do is found in verse 2. It is described in terms of its inability to cleanse definitively the worshippers. Which would mean that they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. Look at verse 2. Otherwise, would they, those Old Testament sacrifices, not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. It is described in terms of this Old Testament sacrifices, is described in terms of its inability to cleanse definitively the worshippers. So that they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. Now a person who has been cleansed would no longer have that consciousness of sin. And this phrase consciousness of sin could literally be translated conscience of sin. The word here translated consciousness. And I don't have to mention the Greek word. It will not make sense to you. It's the same word translated elsewhere in Scripture and in the book of Hebrews as conscience. Hebrews 9.9, 9, Hebrews 9.14, Hebrews 10.22, Hebrews 13.18. It's the same word for conscience. We no longer have conscience of sin. But what does that mean for you, for a worshiper, to have no longer conscience of sin? Does it mean that you will have some kind of amnesia when it comes to your sins? No. We cannot completely erase from our memories the sins that we have committed in the past. 
You often hear David praise, Lord, forgive the sins of my youth. When he remembers them. So what then does it mean? Does it mean that if you have been cleansed, then you will no longer commit any more sin? No, that cannot be the meaning either. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So what does that mean? No longer have conscience of sin when one's cleansed. What does that mean? Does it mean that once cleansed, you no longer will have occasion for repentance, confession of your sins to God, and coming to the throne of grace for fresh forgiveness? No, that's not what I mean either. Scripture elsewhere will rule out that interpretation. For once cleansed, we still need continued cleansing With the blood of Christ. This is clear from what Jesus said to Peter. In the occasion of the washing of their feet. Mentioned in John 13. And also in 1 John 1, 9 that reads. If we confess our sins. It's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what does that mean? No more consciousness or conscience of sin. Here, consciousness of sin or conscience of sin refers to an accusing or guilty conscience that cannot be silent because it cannot find any just and sufficient basis to be silent. In other words, it is the consciousness of guilt because of sin or the consciousness of liability to punishment because of sin that the writer has in mind. A guilty conscience. A conscience that cannot find rest in anything Now, the Old Testament sacrifices could not provide that cleansing of the conscience. It only could provide ceremonial cleansing from ceremonial impurities, but it could not reach down the conscience to cleanse the conscience from guilt. That the Old Testament sacrifices could not do. So it could not make fit a worshiper to draw near the special presence of God. It could not really silence a guilty conscience. Those Old Testament sacrifices. No matter how many bulls, how many sheep, how many goats one offers, the conscience cannot really be silenced. And find rest in those Old Testament sacrifices. The third expression used in our text to describe what the Old Testament sacrifices could not do is found in verse 3 of Romans 10. I'm sorry, Hebrews 10. It is described in terms of its impossibility to take away sins. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, the Old Testament sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Those Old Testament sacrifices could never atone for sin. It could not take away sin. It had no power to satisfy the justice of God and take away sin. 
it had no power to remove the guilt of sin by atoning for it. The Old Testament sacrifices could never take away sins in that it could not really atone for sin. And why? Why is it that the Old Testament sacrifices could not make fit a worshiper draw near to God's special presence? Why could it not silence a guilty conscience? Why is it that it could never atone for sins? Why? The rationale is given in verse 1. Look at the language. Hebrews 10 verse 1, for the law, referring to the old covenant, the covenant God made with the children of Israel in Mount Sinai, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things. Because of that, it can never by the same sacrifice which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw me. It has only a shadow of the good things to come, not the very form of things. And because of that, it can never make perfect those who draw me. It could never atone for sin. It could never silence a guilty now, what are the good things to come referred to here? Well, as clear from the context, it refers to the blessing that would come at the first coming of Christ and the establishment of the new covenant. His incarnation, his death on Calvary, the ratification of the new covenant by the shedding of his blood on the cross of Calvary. Those are the good things to come. The Old Testament the Old Covenant only has a shadow of them. Not the very form of things. And a shadow cannot exist without the form or substance from which a shadow is cast. Moreover, a shadow is just a dark, resemblance of a reality. It is not the reality itself. When you cast a shadow, that's not you. That's only a faint resemblance of you. Not you. Just a resemblance. A shadow. A shadow cannot exist which, without the very form of things. And a shadow is just a resemblance of that which is real. Not the very form of things. A dark resemblance of a reality. It is not the reality itself. Therefore, the old covenant sacrifices could not really take away sins or atone for sins. It could never make a worshiper fit to draw near to God's special presence. It could not really silence a guilty conscience. It could not. It's only a dark resemblance of a reality that was to come, not the very form of things. How can a shadow ever do take away sins, make a worshiper fit to draw near to God's special presence? Silence a guilty conscience. How can a shadow ever do those things when a shadow is just a dark resemblance cast by a reality and is not the reality itself? The old covenant priesthood only resembles the new covenant priesthood. 
the Old Testament tabernacle in Jerusalem was only a shadow that resembles the true tabernacle in heaven, as the book of Hebrews speaks about. The old covenant Jerusalem only resembles the true Jerusalem in heaven. The Old Testament sacrifices only resemble the new covenant sacrifice for sin. It's only a shadow, not the form of things. And it was because the old covenant only has a shadow that its sacrifices had to be repeated year after year after year after year. For the repetition of those sacrifices serves the purpose of reminding the people that those sacrifices could not really take away sin. And this is the main point of the argument in verses 1 to 4. Look at the language. For the law, the old covenant, the covenant God made with the people of Israel in Mount Sinai, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshiper, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness or conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The continual and repeated yearly offering of those sacrifices for sin under the old system, the old covenant, only demonstrated that those sacrifices would not really atone for sin. Moreover, its continual repetition was a perpetual reminder of the people that God still remembers their sins. Their sins have not yet been taken away. There have been no just basis for the forgiveness of their sins. And that a sacrifice for sin that would truly atone for sin was necessary. A sacrifice for sin that would put an end to all the animal sacrifices under the old covenant system. It had to be repeated year after year. After year, after year. Because God was teaching the people that these sacrifices have to be repeated because they cannot really effectively deal with your sin. You need a better sacrifice that will effectively deal with sin. In the language of Philip Hughes, and I quote, Though indeed these sacrifices were concerned with sin, and necessary for its removal, as the ritual of the Day of the Atonement clearly showed, the very consideration that they have been that they were offered by the high priest year after year in itself demonstrated that they were neither perfect nor final. The annually recurring Day of the Atonement accordingly served as a repeated reminder of sin. And by the repetition pointed to the need for a sacrifice that will be full, perfect, and sufficient, and therefore offered once for all, never to be repeated. The people on whose behalf the sacrifice were offered under the old system, thus had their sinfulness brought to their remembrance, as it were. Every time the day of the atonement came around, not to mention the yet more frequent reminders afforded by the innumerable other offerings that were made from day to day. He goes on, but it is worthy to notice the term reminder used here by the writer is potentially ambivalent. 
in that the yearly sacrifices not only reminded the people of their own sinfulness, but also reminded them that God remembers their sin. There has been no just basis for the forgiveness of sin. Hence the tremendous impact of the promise that God will remember their sins no more. Sins remembered by God are sins for which propitiation has not been made. Sins no longer remembered. By God are sins for which full atonement has been freely provided and gratefully received. That is what the old covenant sacrifices could not do. And that is why they could not. Make the worshiper fit to draw near to God's special presence. Silence his guilty conscience or atone and take away his sin. So what is the pastoral thrust of this? Well, for those Jewish Christians during the apostolic era to whom this letter to the Hebrews was written primarily, the pastoral thrust is that there was nothing for them anymore in those Old Testament sacrifices. For them to cling or go back to the shadow when the reality has come, when Christ came, is to reject the reality for the shadow. And that is spiritually fatal. They were not to go back and cling to the shadows when the reality has come. And that's the repeated emphasis of the book of Hebrews. And what is true of Jewish Christians then still applies to all Christians in all and every generation. Why are there now no more animal sacrifices under the new covenant? And why can't we hope ever of the reinstitution of those old covenant animal sacrifices? Why? Those Old Testament system of sacrifice only has a shadow and not the very substance of faith. But then having considered what the Old Testament sacrifices could not do and why, let us consider in the second place what the Lord Jesus Christ did. What the Lord Jesus Christ did. Now, the identity of what the Lord Jesus did is stated in verses 5 to 7. Look at Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 7. Those Old Testament sacrifices could never effectively deal with sin. They were a perpetual reminder of the sins of the people that have not been atoned for. Verse 5, therefore, when he... Comes, and the he clearly refers to Messiah. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, and there's a quotation from the Psalms, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Here the writer, under the infallible guidance of the Holy Spirit, quotes from the Old Testament scripture a psalm of David, particularly Psalm 40. And although the psalm was penned by David, it is obviously a psalm, it is obvious that David is not speaking here in this psalm of his own experience. He is not relating in his psalm his own experience. He writes the experience, but he does not speak of his own experience. It is a messianic psalm. It is a psalm that speaks of the experiences of Messiah. And 
In this particular psalm, it is Messiah himself who speaks about himself through David. Or note the language in verse 5. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice an offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. The language could not refer to just any human being, not even to David. For when does our existence begin? At our conception and birth. I, have, I hope you have no platonic influence that the soul is eternal. No. Our being began at our conception and birth. Body and soul. As clear from Psalm 139. David speaks of God creating him in his mother's womb. Prior to that conception and birth, we did not exist. There is a point of beginning of our existence. And that point of beginning is our conception and birth. But the person here speaking in the psalm is one who already existed even before he was conceived in his mother's womb. He speaks of God preparing a body for him. Therefore, this psalm cannot refer to David. It can only refer to David's distant son, who is also David's Lord. Messiah. Because even before Messiah was conceived and born, he already existed. You remember in John chapter 8, when Jesus said something and the Jews said that, well, you are not even 50 years old and Abraham has seen you or you have seen Abraham? How could you say that you have seen Abraham? You are not even 50 years old. And Jesus said to them, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus made it clear to the Jews that his existence did not begin at his conception and birth. But that even before his conception and birth, his person already existed even before Abraham was born. For Messiah's God had no beginning. As we are told in John, in the beginning, was the word. Even before the first things ever came into being, the word already was. So in this psalm, Psalm 40, penned by David, he is not speaking about his own experience. But he is speaking of the experience of Messiah. It is Messiah who speaks in the psalm which David pens down. David's distant son who is also David's Lord. And what does Messiah say in Psalm 40 which is quoted by the writer to the Hebrews? Messiah says that God did not take, did not really take pleasure in the animal sacrifices of the old covenant. In and of itself, God did not really take pleasure in them. Look at verse 5 again of Hebrews 10. Therefore, when he, Messiah, comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired. God is not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. God did not really find pleasure in those 
sacrificed them. Established under the old covenant. Now this does not mean that God did not institute those animal sacrifices. He did. He did it through Moses. And the writer is careful to emphasize that in verse 8. If you notice in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 10, after saying above sacrifice and offering and hold born offering and sacrifice for sin, you have not desired nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. According to the old covenant system instituted by God through Moses, the law did sanction those sacrifices and not to offer them under the old covenant would have been disobedience to God. They were required to bring them. Nor does the psalm quoted mean that David did not or that God did not take pleasure in those sacrifices when rightly understood and rightly offered. When properly understood and properly offered those sacrifices, God did find pleasure. Psalm 51 verse 19. When David speaks about the sacrifice that really matters to God, he then says, when coming with a proper attitude towards that, in Psalm 51 verse 19, then I will offer. Can't quote that from memory. So, Psalm 51, the penitential Psalm of David, verse 19, David then says, then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. When brought with a proper attitude and a proper understanding of the place of those sacrifices under the old covenant system, God does find delight in them. Not in themselves. But when brought with a proper understanding and proper attitude. But what Messiah meant in this psalm, as quoted by the writer of the Hebrews, is that in and of itself, God did not really find delight and pleasure in those animal sacrifices. In and of themselves. He did not really find delight in them. If brought with the proper attitude, he found delight in them. But in and of himself, he didn't really find pleasure in them. Now because of that, what did they eat? Their, why not? Well, because they, they were not really effective. They're only a shadow. Now, because of that, what did the eternal Son of God, Messiah, do? What did he do then? Because God, in and of itself, did not really find pleasure in those animal sacrifices instituted in the old covenant system. What then, Messiah, what did Messiah do? Verse 7. Then I, Messiah, said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me, of Messiah, to do your will, O oh God. Messiah became incarnate in order to do the will of his God and Father. He will carry out the supreme will and pleasure of God. What does Old Testament sacrifices could not do, Messiah himself will accomplish by doing the will of his God and Father. And what is the result of this act of Messiah? The result is twofold. Notice the first part is stated in verses 8 to 9. 
after saying above in that quotation from the psalm, sacrifice and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then, he said, Messiah said, Behold, I come to do your will. To do that which God really finds pleasures in. He takes away the first. This is the result. By doing that will of God. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. What first and second is the writer talking about here? Well, he's talking about the old covenant system that was replaced with the new covenant. The first covenant is the old covenant that God made with the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. And the second covenant is the new covenant that God promised he will make with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By fulfilling then the supreme will and pleasure of God, in doing, in fulfilling the supreme pleasure of God, in doing the will of God, Messiah has made the old covenant system and sacrifices obsolete. He takes away the first covenant in order to establish the second, the new covenant. The old covenant system and sacrifices has no more divine War, and it will never again have any divine war. He replaces it with a second covenant, a new covenant. Takes away the first. Messiah, by fulfilling the supreme pleasure of God in doing the will of God according to what was prophesied in him in the scroll of the books, the Old Testament scriptures. He takes away the first, the first covenant, the Mosai covenant, the old covenant, in order to establish the second, the new covenant. Then note the second part of the outcome of what Jesus did, as stated in verse 10. By this will, the will of the Father that Jesus came to accomplish and fulfill and do, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now that's glorious. What the Old Testament sacrifices could not do, the Son of God came in order to effect. By this will of God that Messiah came to accomplish according to the prophecies made of him in the Old Testament, Jesus, by fulfilling this will, we have been, believers have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. Again, to be sanctified here means to be cleansed from the guilt of our sins. And therefore made fit to draw near to God's special presence. What the old covenant sacrifices could not do. The once for all sacrifice of the body of Christ in obedience to the will of the Father. It. it accomplished what the old covenant sacrifices could never accomplish. It was the perfect sacrifice that will accomplish 
what the old covenant sacrifices could never do and which the old covenant sacrifices only could point to. Then the writer expands on this thought because he does not want us to miss the point. Look at verses 11 to 13. Every priest, the priest under the old covenant system, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Messiah, in fulfillment of the will of the Father, according to what was prophesied of him under the old covenant. But he, verse 12, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool of his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. What the old covenant sacrifices could not do, Jesus did in fulfillment of the will of his Father. He offered that once for all sacrifice for sin. On Calvary. He could have. Quickly avoided death. If he wanted to. He knew. It was coming. He knew. Who will betray him. He had the power. To vanquish. His captors. But Jesus did not. He came to do the will of God. And that meant obedience even unto the death of the cross. And although he was frightened by that death, for God to pour out his wrath in order to satisfy his justice for the sins of those whom Jesus came to offer the sacrifice for, Jesus trembled and even sweat like drops of blood falling to the ground in Gethsemane, pleading with the Father, if possible, let this cup pass. And yet the Lord's is not my will. If this is what you want, this is what I will do. Your will be done. He accomplished what those Old Testament sacrifices could never accomplish. Atone for sin. Make worshippers fit to draw near to the special presence of God. Silence a Screaming guilty conscience by the offering of a one sacrifice that satisfies completely, irrevocably, the justice of God. Unlike the Levitical priests who had to continually and daily offer sacrifices that could never take away sin, the Lord Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for sin for all time only once. Therefore now in heaven, he is no longer continually sac making sacrifices for sin. No, when he offered one sacrifice for sin, the sacrifice when he sacrificed himself on Calvary, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for the time until all his enemies will be brought to submission to his will, willingly 
or forcibly confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why is Jesus no longer continually offering himself as a sacrifice for sin? Verse 14, for by one sacrifice he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, set apart. Now, to emphasize further the all-sufficiency of the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ to atone for sin for all time, the writer gives a shortened quotation of Jeremiah's prophecy about God replacing the old covenant with the new covenant. A shortened version. The longer version of the quotation is found in Hebrews chapter 8. If you turn there for a moment. In Hebrews 8 verse 8. There is the length, longer quotation from the prophecies of Jeremiah. Verse, let's begin from verse 7. For if that first covenant, the old covenant, the covenant God made with the Israelites in Mount Sinai, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for another, for finding fault with them. He says, Behold, days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, the Mosai covenant, the old covenant, for they did not continue in my covenant. I did not care for them, saith the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days of the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them on their heart. I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will remember their, for I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Verse 13, when he said a new covenant, he has made a first obsolete. And whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And then notice the longer version or the shorter version of that quotation to emphasize the sufficiency of the sacrifice of Christ in doing the will of the Father. After saying in verse 14, for by one offering, Hebrews 10, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. Then he says, he shortens the quotation, and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. There is no longer any offering for sin. The new covenant as the Holy Spirit testifies in the Old Testament scripture, particularly the prophecies of Jeremiah, will include the blessing not only of the internalization of God's law, so that the people will have a heart to obey it. Under the Old Covenant, God's law was written on tablets of stones. God did not promise to internalize the law to all of his Old Covenant people. Many of them, the law was only an external thing. They had no desire to obey the law. They had no ability to obey the law. They have no love for God, love for God's people. It was impossible for them to obey the law. But under the new covenant, God promised, I will do something better. I am going to write my laws on their hearts. I will internalize so that they, when I write my law in their hearts, they will 
find delight in doing my will. Remember the Psalms. Your law is written in my heart. I delight to do your will, O God. But foundational to that new covenant promise that will replace the old covenant, it will not only include the blessing of the internalization of God's law so that the people will have a heart to obey, but also the blessing that God will no longer remember their sins. He will provide a just basis for the forgiveness of sins. And he will remember their sins no more. For God not to remember the sins of his people does not, of course, mean that he will completely have no memory of their sins that his people have done. No, that is impossible because God is all-knowing. What he means is that God will no longer hold their sins against them. He will not charge those sins against them because he has already made a just basis for the forgiveness of sins. That once for all sacrifice of Christ when he fulfilled the will of the Father. And since God has already made provision for the complete forgiveness of their sins in the once for all sacrifice of Christ, there has been a just basis for the forgiveness of sins under the new covenant, then there is no longer any offering for sin. All the old covenant sacrifices were to cease. To stop. The new covenant people of God are not to offer any sacrifice of sin according to the old covenant system. Under the new covenant, there is no longer any offering for sin. Christ made that once for all sacrifice for sin. God will remember the sins of his people no more. Unlike the old covenant, there was a repetition of the sacrifice year after year after year to remind the people that there has not yet been a just basis for the forgiveness of sins. Under the new, God promised, I will remember their sins no more. I will provide a just basis for the forgiveness of of their sins and therefore there is no longer any offering for sin not even to remind the people of their sin therefore whatever spiritual sacrifices we bring to God under the new covenant the sacrifice of praise the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the sacrifice of a broken and a contrite heart, the sacrifice of a consecrated life, they, they are spiritual sacrifices that we are to bring under the new covenant. Those sacrifices are not sacrifices to atone for sin. Or under the new covenant, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Christ made a once for all sacrifice. And in that sacrifice in Calvary, we have all the sacrifice we need to atone for all of our sins. That's glorious. What could be more plainer? The Bible is plain on this. 
Now, have you noticed? I didn't even take just one verse and exegete it thoroughly and completely. No, we just got a long chunk of the Bible because the Bible makes it very clear and plain in large chunks so that we won't miss the point. What could be more plain? The writer under the infallible guidance of the Holy Spirit repeats and seeks to prove again and again this one single issue. And if you think this emphasis is not necessary, think again. The Roman Catholic Church deliberately ignores this clear teaching from the Word of God. They still believe in the need of a continuing sacrifice for sins, both for the living and the dead, in the sacrifice of the blasphemous mass. You say that's too strong a word. Because that is contrary to the word of God. It negates the greatness of the sacrifice Christ offered on Calvary. And that theology and practice cuts across the grains of the teaching of the word of God. It is to deny the distinctiveness of the new covenant that God has established at the first coming of Christ during the apostolic generation. It is to go back to the shadows of old covenant system dressed to make it appear like a new covenant reality. And to believe that error is damning to your soul. And the tragedy of this is captured in the Irish saying, High money, high mass. Low money, low mass. No money, no mass. You have to pay for it. What a tragedy. It's the greatest hoax. Breeding people of their hard-earned money for something that is a lie. When Jesus offered himself on Calvary, he did it once. What the Old Testament sacrifices could not do, he accomplished once. For all in Calvary. Under the new covenant, there is no longer any offering for sin. So don't blame the Protestants for protesting against Rome. That was not rebellion, submission. To the clear word of God, no matter what the cost. And Martin Luther said, here I stand. I can do no other. Help me, God. In fact, even evangelicals today sometimes think that somehow they have to do something hard and painful in order to atone for their sins and find forgiveness from God. Not in the sacrifice of the Mass. Not in having themselves crucified at Lent or flagellated at Lent to atone for sins. But sometimes evangelical fall into the error thinking that somehow they have to do something hard, something painful, in order to atone for their sins and find forgiveness from God. 
No, under the new covenant, there is no longer any offering for sin, for Christ made at once for all sacrifice to atone for all his sins, for all of his people, for all time. And my friend, listen, in that once for all sacrifice of Christ in Calvary, you have all the sacrifice you need to atone for all of your sins. All of them. All you have to do is to make a heart commitment to turn away from your sin and trust in Christ and Christ alone that His once for all sacrifice in Calvary is all the sacrifice you need to atone for all of your sin. And once your faith lays hold of that, that would silence your guilty conscience. It will make you fit to draw near to the special presence of God. And you don't have to pay anything for your sins. For he paid it all. Now if you have never experienced this forgiveness from God. Then for the very first time come to Christ for that forgiveness. Believe that Jesus' sacrifice is all the sacrifice you need to atone for all of your sins. Don't think that you have to punish yourself first before you can for receive forgiveness. No. Just humbly recognize you cannot pay for your sins. You are guilty. And in faith lay hold of that sacrifice of Christ and Calvary. And you will be forgiven by God. You will be reconciled to God. And God will make you a member of his family. And to us who have trusted in Christ, listen. Although we have received a once for all forgiveness of our sins that radically changed our spiritual relationship with God forever, we still daily need cleansing and forgiveness. Where do we find a sacrifice for ongoing forgiveness? Only in the sacrifice of God. Go to Him. As the fountain open for sin and iniquity. In the language of John. And if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sin. And for the sins of the whole world. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the glory of God's way of salvation. If you try to pay for your sins, you will have to spend an eternity in hell. But God has made a provision. A just basis for the forgiveness of sin and the sacrifice of his son. And as we believers remember him in the Lord's Supper, let's think of his death. Let's remember why he had to die. Do this in the language of Jesus. The celebration of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of me. Remember my work. Remember what I have done for you. Remember what I did. Which the Old 
covenant sacrifices could never do. Remember him.